Hello grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to another lecture. As you can see, this is lesson six. Uh, the title is huge. It barely fits across the bottom banner, but as you can see, I made it work. And I don't really like the look of this big blocky thing in the middle, but that's okay. I guess I'll get past it because I've only shown for a couple of seconds. So this is the self-fulfilling prophecy and the placebo effect. So let's get right into it. The first slide is a little story. Uh, you don't need to write this down unless you want to or think of it as an example, but it's something to think about to set us up for the self-fulfilling prophecy. So was she doomed? One young woman died of fear in a most peculiar way. When she was born on Friday the 13th, the midwife who delivered her and two other babies that day announced that all three were hexed and would die before their 23rd birthday. The other two did die young, and as the third woman approached her 23rd birthday, she checked into a hospital and informed the staff of her fears. The staff noted that she dealt with her anxiety by extreme hyperventilation, which is deep breathing. Shortly before her birthday, she hyperventilated to death. So, I guess the prophecy was fulfilled, um, but I guess the, the real question is why? Um, if there was no prophecy, would it have been, would she have died? It's an interesting question. So the self-fulfilling prophecy is a situation in which a researcher or individual's expectations influence the behavior. Uh, so in an experiment, that could also influence the participant's behavior. Once an expectation is set, we tend to act in ways that are consistent with that expectation. So how did the woman in the excerpt die? She hyperventilated because of the prophecy and then died only because of that prophecy. If she had not known about the statement, would she have hyperventilated and died? Unlikely. The woman unintentionally fulfilled the prediction. Uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because of the prediction, she acted in a way that fulfilled that prediction. And people do that all the time. Uh, if you have an expectation that you're going to do well, you will act in a way that will cause you to do well. If you are, have an expectation that you are not going to do well in a class, you will unconsciously, subconsciously act in a way that will cause you to not do well in the class. It is a true phenomenon. That it's, it's all about perspective and about how um, you act to fulfill the expectation. So self-fulfilling prophecy is very real. It's less extreme generally than the hyperventilation example. Um, but it happens all the time in our daily lives and in research. So uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy involves having expectations about a behavior and then acting in some way, usually unknowingly, to carry out that behavior. Uh, in everyday life, we consciously or unconsciously tip people off as to what our expectations of them are. We give them cues. If you're talking to someone and you agree with them, you nod. You nod, and that ad, that shows them that um, they should talk more about that, or you agree with them about that, and, and you two can bond over that. Or if you raise your eyebrows, it shows that you're skeptical, and people will pick up on those cues, and then they'll be able to act as expected. So if, so if I'm talking about something and I see that someone is disagreeing um, you know maybe you know you don't need to talk about that anymore you pick up on that cue and you act as expected so um, psychologists must be aware of such cues when they're conducting experiments there was an example uh, there is an example uh, there was a horse named Hans that everyone thought could count he would go around to different fairs and he would tap his hoof uh, the number of times that he that his master said and people just thought that he was so talented, he could tap the number of times he knew what numbers were. Um, the thing was, when Hans was tapping, there was always a pause between each tap. And when he got to the proper number, like if it was seven, once he got to seven, the crowd would cheer and Hans would know that he should stop tapping. If there was no crowd um, to cheer, there might be individuals that would be excited when they got to that number or the master could sub, um, you know, subtly give it away. So the horse could not actually count, but the horse was smart enough to realize that when they got to a certain tapping number, um, they were praised and then they should stop. If they kept going after they were, you know, after the cheer, then everyone was disappointed. 
So they knew that they shouldn't keep going anymore. It wasn't about counting. It was about the expectation that the Hans would get to that number and then everyone acting in a way that produced that behavior or stopping at the proper number. So one way in research to avoid bias and the self-fulfilling prophecy uh, is to use a single blind or double blind technique. So we're going to talk about the double, uh, sorry, the single blind first. So in a single blind experiment, um, the participants are unaware of what uh, they are getting for a treatment. So some of them are getting the actual treatment and some of them are getting the placebo. Uh, a placebo, as I hope you did a little bit of research and found out that it is anything that seems to be a real medical treatment, but is it isn't. Could be a pill or a shot uh, or other fake treatment, usually a sugar pill or saline water. Uh, whatever, what all placebos have in common is that they do not contain an active substance meant to affect health. So they just make people think that they're being treated when they are actually not. So you separate them. This is usually the control group in a medical experiment. You give them a placebo, a non-real uh, medical treatment. <clears throat> so for example, a psychologist wants to study the effects of a particular tranquilizer. She might give the drug to an experimental group and a placebo to a control group. So control group so that she can see exactly why, like what the effect is. Everything's the same except for this tranquilizer in the experimental group. The next step would be to compare their performance on a series of tests. Um, this is a single blind experiment, so they don't know what they are getting. The participants are blind in the sense that they don't know whether they have received the tranquilizer or a placebo, and then they all perform the tests. Some of them will act drowsy even though they haven't got the tranquilizer. Just like some people you've seen or heard might act drunk when they haven't drank that much alcohol, but they expect that that's what it's supposed to do to them. Um, so they're trying to avoid that expectation. You don't know if you got the treatment or if you got the placebo. You can avoid this even more with a double blind experiment. This is an experiment in which neither the experimenter nor the participants know which participants received the treatment. So in the other method that we just talked about, um, she could, for example, ask the pharmacist to number rather than label the pills. And then after she's given them out, got everything like the test back and scored them, she can then see which participants got what. So she doesn't know right away which are in which group. And that way, the researcher will not influence the behavior of the participants in any way. So it's double blind. Neither of them know what treatment they got. Somebody else does, and you can find out later, but neither of them know. Uh, so this is a double-blind experiment. Neither the participants nor the experimenter know which participants receive the tranquilizer. This eliminates the possibility that the researcher will unconsciously find what she expects to find about the effects of the drug. The researcher therefore remains unbiased, and that is very important so that you don't project your feelings onto um, the participants and then have a self-fulfilling prophecy. So single and double blind experiments are meant to uh, stop the self-fulfilling prophecy and to stop any kind of bias. We're into the your job section. So there are four important terms today, triple blind data, qualitative and quantitative. And then there is a little bit of a review and I want you to think a little bit about single and double blind experiments. Um, finish that assignment. And if you guys have any questions at all, please let me know. Uh, in class, Google Meet, uh, through email, whatever works for you. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I will see you soon.